Hi, uh, my name is Timothy Gager, and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. Um, and welcome to our fall session. Our special guest tonight is uh, Michael Keith, and Michael is going to uh, give us some of his literary expertise and reading. Um, but let me uh, tell you a little bit about Michael here. And, uh, and this is where we need to go. Hang on. This is, uh, here we go, about Michael Keith. He is the author of the acclaimed memoir, The Next Better Place, a young, a young adult novel, Life is Falling Sideways, and 18 story collections, including Of Night and Light. And there's a whole big list of them. If you blink your eyes and if the website's not uh, updated, suddenly there'll be 21 story collections, knowing how prolific Michael is. He's been nominated for a Pushcart Prize several times, a Penn O. Henry Award, was a finalist for the National Indie Excellence Award for Short Fiction Anthologies, and a finalist for the 2013 International Book Award in the Fiction Visionary category. He entered, before entering the realm of fiction, Michael wrote several groundbreaking books in the field of radio studies, including a title chosen by President Clinton to appear on his official summer reading list which is Waves of Rancor. So without anything else from me, y'all are here to hear Michael anyway. So let's uh, turn it over to Michael Keith. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I think I've been with you uh, five times now since uh, the early part of this century. Uh, thanks everybody for showing up. I'm just so delighted to see old friends here. Uh, I haven't seen Robin in ages. And, and my buddy Paul and, and DeWitt and Scotty, uh, one of the great short, short writers around. Uh, you've had him on uh, Dyer, uh, Tim, Scotty? No, no, but you the person's on there. now. We'll have yeah, to get him got, on. Yeah, yeah, he's done some wonderful books. Anyway, it's a, it is a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, uh, I'll read a few things. Uh, th uh, thanks, Robin, for holding up. Uh, <laughs> this is the, my most recent. Uh, it was published last uh, June by Cabal Books. But I thought today what I'd do is I'll read uh, some stories from my newest manuscript called Quiet Geography. Uh, and uh, you can give me your thoughts on, on, on that when I'm done. So then, without further ado, uh, first piece is called uh, when the world goes strange at an early age. It wasn't until the end of the semester I noticed my history teacher's right forefinger was missing. I mentioned it to my classmate after school, but they didn't believe me. Apparently they hadn't noticed. It was too late to prove I was right because we wouldn't be back in class until after the summer break. I thought maybe our art teacher who lived down the street a couple of houses would or could verify what I'd seen. And when I asked her, she said, certainly he was lacking a finger because she had it. Would you like to see it? She inquired. <clears throat> this is called Do It Right For Less. $1.59 was what Home Depot charged for a pair of latex palm coated work gloves. Chad didn't think there was a better bargain to be had anywhere. Less than two bucks to protect your hands? Are you kidding? He thought he needed to thank somebody and ask to see the store manager. This is called Celtic Cowboy. <clears throat> After watching The Bronco Kid starring Hoot Gibson at the Luxor Cinema in Paris, literary icon James Joyce told his publisher Sylvia Beach he was thinking about writing a Western featuring Stephen Daedalus as an Arizona sheriff hunting cattle rustlers with his Navajo sidekick, Shem. She suggested he finish his newest Dublin-based novel first, even though she'd been having difficulty getting through the early draft. This is called His Late Friend. He'd just been phoned by a friend and told a mutual friend 
had died when he noticed a text from the friend who he was just told had died. He wondered if he'd seen the message first and then ignored the call, if he'd still be waiting at Starbucks for his friend who he'd just been told had died. Getting some strange stares here. <laughs> this is an epistolary form of, uh, of uh, story. It's called Mixed Message. Dear Elliot, I'm writing you out of concern. Last night I dreamed you were diagnosed with a fatal disease and had only a short time to live. I know you're probably thinking I shouldn't be telling you this and causing you worry, but I only do so because my dreams seem to be coming true lately, which rather excites me, except in your case, of course. Would you rather I not have told you? I figure it might give you something of a heads up. Not that there's anything you can do. Your friend, Ben. This is called Past Imperfect. <clears throat> the fact that she's an ex-wife troubles her. There's nothing good about being an ex-wife, she concludes. So she begins to plot how she might get her ex-husband to remarry her, thus erasing the negative prefix. When she broaches the subject with him, he says he's had enough of her to last a lifetime, and she'll have to adjust to the idea that she'll always be his ex-wife. She believes he's trying to suppress a chuckle and wonders if one remains an ex when one's ex is deceased. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is called Strangers Next Door. Our neighbors have gone cold on us. No more friendly waves or chit chats. We're vexed and disturbed by the sudden silence and attempt to fill out or to find out why this is happening. Why are we being snubbed? But our calls go unanswered. We've noticed ambulances going down the street late at night and wonder if there's something going on we don't know about. Finally, we decide to confront the situation head on and go to our neighbor's houses, but no one answers their door. My wife thinks she might know what the problem is, but I don't think it has anything to do with the blood stains on our clothes. And this is called <clears throat> working toward a resolution. He found a black wavy hair under his egg in the diner where he ate. It disgusted him to find a black wavy hair under his egg. He waved the waitress over and showed her the black wavy hair under his egg. She said, did you put that black wavy hair under the egg to get a free meal? This incensed him and he picked up the plate and with the black wavy hair under the egg and tossed it. The waitress retrieved the plate with the black wavy hair under the egg and returned it to her customer, declaring there was no longer a black wavy hair under the egg. That's all I have here. You said seven to 10, I figured that's about seven. All right, that's great stuff. Uh, and uh, I especially really enjoyed the last one, but we'll start with a question from the gallery right away. Uh, uh, Robin Stratton has asked that she says she loves your titles. So which comes first? Do you get a title in your head and write a story to the title? Or does the story come first and then you add the title? I'd say most of the time it's a title. Uh, not all the time, but, uh, but it just seems to work that way. I'll hear something or something will just pop into my head or, you know, something will happen. I'll read something and then the title will come. And the title generally comes with baggage. In other words, it generally comes with a storyline, something to, to, to fiddle with. A lot of times, uh, uh, 
I, I like the title more than the story, and, and, or the title comes and, and I try to best the title. <laughs> and a lot of times it's very hard to best the title, but it gives me something immediately to shoot for. Uh, uh, I think lately uh, I've been coming up with story ideas before I, before I come up with the title. As a matter of fact, that's, that's true. As a matter of fact, uh, lately I've had uh, more of a challenge coming up with a title after I've written the story, which is kind of in reverse for me. Uh, because it's always been the case that, for, for me anyway, that the title was the inducement uh, to add more words. With that, the title coming first, if it, makes, if it makes me feel like you're kind of a linear thinker and a linear writer. Do you consider yourself that way or do you consider yourself a visual writer? Uh, that's a good question. I think what I write is visual, you know. I, I think maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe that's not the case. But uh, uh, oftentimes my titles are prompted by my surroundings or something visual. So I think it's two way street. I don't think you can do one without the other. Uh, yeah. I mean, there, uh, before me, I see many wonderful writers. So uh, feel free to jump in if you have further thoughts on that. That will just end up in chaos and just warning. Yeah. You. Yeah. Um, any feature films from any of your individual stories? Any offers your, there? From your mouth to God's ears. <laughs> I, I wish. Uh, I, uh, my memoir has been floating around out in uh, Tinseltown for, for a long, long time. And I think it'll just probably continue to float. Uh, there was a time I was more actively engaged in that because I, I co-authored the screenplay with a screenplay with a screenwriter out there. And it did look like once or twice that things might start to percolate, uh, but as, as it is often the case, things quickly unpercolate. And, and uh, so I, I found that you're, you, know, you, you don't wanna hang your hat on anything like that. You don't wanna get your, your hopes up too high because uh, it, it's, it, it's an incredible long shot uh, I, I, I think I mentioned before, I went to a lecture uh, by Pauline Kale, the great New Yorker uh, film critic, and she told a story about how um, Warren Beatty had hired her away from the New Yorker uh, by uh, uh, suggesting to her that uh, he had a room full of screenplays and he would just like her to read them and, and recommend any that she thought were worthy of, of his attention. And she did it and she went out there. But, but after six months, she quit in, in kind of a deep depression because she said uh, about every screenplay she read in that room and she had read hundreds were fantastic. And she knew none of them would get produced or, or you know, one tenth of 1%. And I think that, that kind of tells, tells the tale. Real is tough. It's very tough business. Now, with your writing career, you started out writing nonfiction radio, uh, books on radio, then a memoir, and then some, some novels, and then fiction, and then microfiction. You seem to be going from larger to smaller. So can you get any smaller than the microfictions that you just read? <laughs> Oh yeah, these are the longer microfictions. I deliberately didn't uh, read the one or two lines because I, I feel that they're they're tough uh, to read because I think they need the framework of white space to really be effective. I think you read something that's so short, it goes by so fast and you're going on to the next thing that the person who listens to them doesn't have a chance to absorb them uh, to, to understand them. To, so, I, so literally something like this, that's a longer piece for me. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I, and I honestly think probably uh, for me, the shorter it is, it's probably the better it is. I don't know what that says. Well, with the evolution of that in your writing, do you find it difficult to try, if you tried to write longer stuff again, do you find it difficult? Are you in your sweet spot now? 
Phil's got that cheese eating grin on his face because he's always encouraging me. Why didn't you go on and, and write something longer? Because there are times when I, when, when I honestly think maybe I need to shift gears and go another way. Uh, uh, but I've trained my psyche for some reason to, to be in that modality. And every day, every day micros, uh, prose poetry, as the literati like to call it, pop, you know, they, they just assert themselves, they insinuate themselves. So most days I write anywhere from one to three. Uh, I've written six and eight sometimes. And it, and I just seem to be in that modus operandi. Uh, uh, you know, there are times I question that and wonder if that's necessarily such uh, a good thing. I, I suspect I'll go back to, to, to something longer. Uh, in the future, but right now, you know, that, that's what's there and that's what's present. Well, you released a book of, again, micro shorts in May, 2021, pieces of bone and rags, and here that is. And the memoir you talked about came out in 2003, The Next Better Place. So, <laughs> you, so you released a book in 2021 and uh, this came out in 2003. So what is different in the process of publishing, releasing, and promoting books in those 15 to 18 years? What has changed? Uh, people have stopped reading. <laughs> the internet has asserted its primacy and its terror on the world. You know, uh, yeah, when I did uh, The Next Better Place for Algonquin Books, uh, I mean, that's going on 20 years ago now. Uh, there were so many more bookstores. The, the little town I'm in had three bookstores. There are no bookstores here any longer. The closest bookstore to me is Borders, which is 12, 14 miles away from me. Uh, it just doesn't, it, it just seems it, it, that people aren't reading as much fiction anymore. Uh, uh, and if they were, I, I suspect there'd still be the small mom and top uh, pop bookstores, uh, but uh, so I think I think uh, the amount of reading that people do has suffered cons as a consequence uh, of what we're looking at right now. Uh, that's where people are spending their time. Uh, I I asked my students. I started asking my students six or seven years ago, how many of you have read a novel uh, this year, and invariably half of them would indicate it. Uh, that number shrunk to the point now when I ask them, nobody, nobody's read a novel. Nobody has read a novel. And yeah, these are 20, 22 year olds. And, and that, that does not bode well for the field of literature. I don't, I don't think maybe they'll come back to it. We all, we all hope that they do come. Consequently, I think uh, publishers have, have become uh, 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 a little bit wary because their profits are shrinking. Uh, on the other hand, the internet has spawned webzines. Uh, it has spawned uh, small independent uh, book publishers. So on that end, uh, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily any more difficult for, for people to get uh, a book published now, even though there are fewer people reading than it was 20 years ago. It, it's just, uh, it's, it, it's just done differently. And, and the larger commercial publishers, uh, they're reining things in. They're the ones that are having a difficult time. They've lost their venue to sell their books in a, in a lot of ways, and they're fighting Amazon. And, and it's a losing battle for them. To, to fight Amazon. So thing, yeah, in the last uh, 15 to 20 years, things have changed rather dramatically. Um, Amanda asked, uh, coming from a career like radio, what was the hardest habit you had to break from transitioning from that kind of writing um, to the more creative writing that you do now? And how would you recommend <clears throat> breaking out of such specialized form to writing successful work in different mediums? That's a, that, that's a great question because that's one I thought about. I, I had uh, co-authored 38 academic book volumes. Uh, half of those I, I did as a solo author. The other half I did with a partner, Robert, Robert Hilliard. Uh, writing for the academic 
market is easy because uh, uh, you, 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 you have a specific theme and a specific target, uh, an audience you're writing for, and the academic presses uh, are, are not difficult to convince that this is a, uh, an, adopt, an adoptable title. Uh, so when, when I would conceive an idea for a book, and I, I was the one who did that, maybe that's where that creative thing comes from, um, I'd write up a, a, a proposal and know what publisher to go to and, and know the market. And, and so it was, but it's a different kind of writing, certainly a, a, a different kind of writing. Uh, you're writing from research, you know, you're gathering material. You don't have to conceive, uh, you know, the storyline of a book. I wrote a book uh, about how Native Americans utilized radio. There'd never been a book that had that theme in it, but it was a matter of finding that out. It's investigative much more, uh, I think, than, uh, than standard fiction, although there, there may be a lot of investigation in certain types of fiction too. But I did my, I did my due diligence. I, I found virtually nothing out there. And, I, and, and at the time I, I did have the benefit of the, of the internet. I think it was around 2000, oh boy, I even forget, 2007, 2008. <clears throat> but uh, I had to be in touch with Native Americans at different reservations across the country. And many of those did not have the internet. So uh, I made phone calls. I even visited a reservation or two. Uh, the Aquasocity Res Mohawk Reservation on the Canadian border. I spent a couple of days, but I gathered my material. And then from there, it, it was a matter of organizing it into something organic and cohesive and, and then convincing a publisher that there was a market for it, which there really wasn't, but I was pretty persuasive and found, found a publisher uh, that thought, well, they liked the idea but there was no adoption market for it, uh, uh, you know. And, and I thought when I wrote this, and it was just a barely 200 pages, that it was just an introductory work. I thought it would spawn all sorts of excitement and interest on the part of academic researchers to do more studies of Native American uh, radio, Native American broadcasting. To this day, it's the only book that exists. Uh, I was invited to the Library of Congress two years ago to speak about that. And there I said, there's so much more that can be written about this. This is now essentially a cliff notes because there's a third more stations out there. So much more has happened, but uh, there, there's, there's no, no follow up to it. In fact, uh, the monographs that I wrote on uh, uh, underground radio, hippie radio and whatnot and, and, and other uh, titles along those lines still remain the only, the, the only title on the subject that's out there. And maybe for good reason, because maybe they caught on that there's just no, you know, no way to sell these things. You know. But uh, now transitioning over to fiction, uh, what is it as hard as you may think, because a lot of these books that I was writing about Native Americans that I was writing about uh, the counterculture and telling stories in these monographs, uh, 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 I think, grease the rails a little bit to, to, to write fictional stories. But, but I, I had in mind when I was uh, eight, nine, 10 years old, story writing. And, and in fact, my mother years and years ago pulled out a story that I wrote when I was nine years old about a cowboy. You know, so I guess it, that that was there, you know, and I think it it's there for most of the people who I see on the screen are, are writers, fiction writers, uh, do it's an academic and a, and a fiction writer and an essayist and and uh, Lindy and Phil and, and a poet and, now and Scotty and so and you yeah so so you know what I'm talking about. So I've got a question for you, and without getting into the whole book, I'll paraphrase The Next Better Place, which pretty much is a story about Michael as a, as a young boy traveling around the 
country with this dysfunctional dad. And it was quite an education. This is quite a book. But um, from that upbringing, which was very challenging to you and very difficult for you, um, what, how much of that upbringing seeps into your stories now? And what of that do you weed out? Uh, everything in my story is about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I took a, a step back, even the, the stuff I read tonight, there's something of me in everything, everything, there. you know, uh, maybe I didn't experience certain things firsthand, but it was part of my, my interior uh, 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 cinema, you know, that came from something else, some other source that I did have hands on. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, yeah, it, it, it formed clearly whether it formed me. I think sometimes people say your weird childhood is responsible for that weird stuff that you write. And I say, well, yeah, of course, you know, I, I, I don't deny it. It is, I, you know, I think, you know, most Robin certainly had tons of experience in terms of publishing people and publishing her own books. Likewise, Scotty and whatnot. So, you know, we, we live it, rewrite it. Uh, I don't think anybody writes a pure fiction. Uh, you know, I, I just, I can't imagine that. Now, now when you write, do you ever write something that's really, really uh, affects you after the fact? Because I know that for me, sometimes I'll read some various poems and I'm emotionally drained. Do you ever reach that or feel that? Um. I have a tendency not to go back and read anything I write. I just don't do it. Uh, I, 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 after uh, the book, The Next Better Place came out, uh, I never read it. I did, when the audio book came out, I listened to the first chapter and I've, ne I've never listened to the audio book. You know, uh, the, the, the closest I came to, to rereading it was when I was uh, co-writing the screenplay because it was in, in front of me. Uh, of the 20 books now, uh, books of fiction and sh uh, short stories, uh, I couldn't tell you what's in them. I just never go back. I never, ever look back at them. And maybe I'm afraid of what I'll find, but not afraid that it will frighten me what I wrote. Maybe I'm afraid that what I'll read isn't good. <laughs> and I don't want to be reminded that I wrote something that really sucks either. You know, I mean, let sleeping dogs lie. You know, they're there. That's fine. Well, I'll admit uh, once or twice I've gone back out of morbid curiosity and, and I've read a couple of the old, old stories, 10, 5, 12 years ago, and they've held up. Uh, so what, have I, what did I feel? About? I, I felt relief. Oh, this didn't suck. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't come away with the thinking, oh, what a masterful story. Uh, not that at all. Uh, if anything, I probably came away thinking, you could have probably done better here or there. But, you know, they're done. They're done. All right, let's wrap this up with the last question from DeWitt. And it says, uh, have you ever tried parodying Proverbs in the Bible or in William Blake? Uh, parodying? Maybe unintentionally, uh, but uh, not deliberately. Uh, I've quoted quoted from it uh, here and there, but that's as far as I've had the uh, good sense to to go. So, um, that what you read from tonight has that been contracted up, or uh, is that are you looking for a publisher for that? Yeah, that uh, uh, the quiet geography. Uh, I've, I've submitted uh, and uh, I'm waiting to hear, see what happens. I haven't been very aggressive about it. Uh, it's it, 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 as recently as a couple of weeks ago, I was tweaking it and adding something to it. So it's a newbie and we'll see what happens. So this is Michael Keith. So his latest book is Pieces of Bones and Rags from uh, May of this year. And so I suggest that you pick this one up and also go back and maybe look at some of the books that he's never, ever read again that he's put out. There's so many of them. And Michael, uh, earlier we'd said that uh, 
we loved your bookcase and uh, the books that are just yours. Uh, can you show us that view of like the Michael Keith library? There it is, 20 plus books. No, no, by. there's there's about 40 there. The uh, the uh, the top level are fiction and the second level are nonfiction books. <laughs> he, he, Tim made me do that. I did ask to have that done. <laughs> well, you know what? I always try to push the more humble writers to uh, show their stuff because it's you're very humble, Michael, and your uh, your books are incredible. So people check that out. And thank you so much for being our guest. Thank you. Thank everybody. Take care.